Hi, this is George Howard for Artist House Music. This is Music Business 101, Chapter 5, The Importance of the Gig. In the last chapter, I implored you to shrink your world. Rather than looking out to the distant horizon of what your career as an artist or music business entrepreneur could be, I instead suggested you look closely at your immediate surroundings. The goal of this was to begin to get you thinking about how you can most efficiently take action towards achieving your goals. Too often new artists look to other artists who are already enjoying success and then determine that they too should achieve that same level of success without appreciating the myriad steps between the artist's current situation and his desired situation. I've heard from countless artists over the years that if they could just get their music played on the radio, that people would love it. They may be right. However, the reality is that songs don't just get played on the radio. Rather, airplay is a result of countless other accomplishments all leading to the moment the song graces the airwaves. Given the fact that the path to success is paved with a series of actions, it's important to consider where to start. Fortunately, there's one immediate goal that should be focusing all of your initial actions, getting a gig. In this chapter, we'll cover why the gig is so important and discuss ways in which you can leverage the gig to lead to other opportunities. We begin, therefore, where we left off last time. Shrinking your world in order to make sure you're focusing on the right actions to get and maximize the gig. The reason I'm so resolutely certain that playing live is the essential first step for artists is because the live performance is ground zero. It's the hub from which all other connections emanate. Think about it. By playing a gig, you're of course connecting with an audience who you must attract and retain if you ever want to succeed as a musician, but the opportunity for connections at a live event expands much further out to ju than just to potential fans. The live show is where all sorts of people who make up the ecosystem of the music business congregate. Everyone from booking agents to managers to lawyers, publicists, writers, DJs to A&R people all go out and hear music. Even if these people aren't there in person, they're often talking to those who were. In my capacity as an A&R person and a record executive, there wasn't a week that went by when I wasn't talking to some club booker who was telling me about some great band who had just played there. Additionally. There was rarely a day that went by when some manager or lawyer wasn't telling me about someone they saw blow away a room. The fact is, I cared about what these people were saying because they were telling me about these artists not based on taste, which is so arbitrary as to be meaningless, but on some empirical verifiable evidence the artists were blowing audiences away. I went to see these bands. I did not ever go out and see bands based on some unsolicited demo they sent me. Far more important than the habits of A&R people and other record executives is the reality that these live gig gigs give you not only an excuse, but a mandate to connect with other people in the industry. If you're not playing a show somewhere, for instance, you really have no reason to send your CD to the local press. If, on the other hand, you have a gig coming up, not only do you have a right to inform the local media of the show, it's incumbent upon you to do so. This is not to say that they'll drop everything to come see you, but over time, you begin to become familiar to these people, and eventually, they will give you coverage. We'll focus on details of just how to present your music to the media shortly. For now, we need to take a step backwards and think about how you will get that first gig. The reality is that you're sort of faced with a catch-22. You can't get a gig until you have shown someone that you can draw a crowd, and you can't show someone you can draw a crowd until you can get a gig. So, the way you get around this is to initially, and maybe for quite some time, focus on what I call non-professional gigs. By this I mean playing places where you likely aren't going to get paid. This could be house parties, church events, open mics, whatever you can dream up. Beyond it being the only way to start playing, it has some additional benefits. For instance, playing in a less pressured environment than some club allows you to work on your performance. Most people don't emerge with the stage presence of Bruce Springsteen. In fact, Bruce Springsteen didn't emerge with the stage presence of Bruce Springsteen. Rather, he played and played and played, engaged his audience. When did they react? Do more of that. When didn't they react? Do less of that. Until he developed into what he is. You must do this too. And you can't really do it via professional gigs at first. The reason is, is that if you stink up the joint a few times, you're not going to get the opportunity to stink it up again. Therefore, it's crucial that you play shows where you can try different things until you begin to find your own style. Equally important is that by playing these non-professional gigs for some period of time, you'll be able to build a fan base. It may be small, but there's a huge difference between playing to two people and playing to even 30 or 50 people. 
Once you've got even a small group of dedicated fans and you have your performance down, you can consider playing one of these professional shows. That is, you can book yourself a gig at a club. Chances are you will be given a midweek slot early in the evening. This is fine. It gives you an opportunity to call upon those fans you've made playing your non-professional gigs and get them to come support you. Believe me, most artists playing a Tuesday night at 8 p.m. won't have done the legwork you've done and will be playing to an empty room. When you bring in even a few dozen people, it will make an impression on the person who books the room. Combine this with a great performance and you won't be playing Tuesday nights at 8 for too long. All of that said, you should really consider how imperative it is to dive into the world of professional gigs at all. There are any number of artists who built their following by playing non-traditional places. Bright Eyes, for instance, played house parties all over the country for years before playing club gigs. Fugazi insisted on playing in non-traditional venues. There's some real wisdom to this approach. By playing the traditional venues, you sort of align yourself with the tradition and axiomatically can become just another band. On the other hand, if when you play, it's at some place interesting and unusual, not only is the gig more of an event, but you become a noteworthy, more noteworthy artist. In this age where there are so many artists out there, it's essential to find ways to differentiate yourself. Playing in non-traditional places and making each performance an event is one of the good ways to do this. Playing the gig is just one small part of the equation. It's really what you do before and after the gig that matters. The first thing you have to reconcile is what you're going to be selling or giving away at the gig. That is, do you have a CD of songs you can either sell or give to people who are interested? Of course, you may need the CD to get the gig itself. A few rules about these so-called demo CDs. First, they should be multi-purpose in nature. You should be able to not only use the demo to get the gig by mailing it to the venue, but you should also be able to sell it, give it away at the venue. Finally, it should be the centerpiece of what you send out in your press package to the local media and retailers when you have an upcoming gig. Second, you really don't need to have a whole album's worth of material on this recording. In fact, too many songs can hurt you. Put your best three or four songs, best one first, on the recording and get it out there. Anyone who hears a recording with a great first song will forgive two or three not so great songs that follow. They won't, however, forgive 10 or 11 lame songs after an initial good one. Also, if you've only got three or four songs on your recording, you can either sell it for real cheap or give it away without feeling like your art has no value. The third rule is to make sure that the songs on this recording represent whatever you do in as emphatic a manner as possible. It really doesn't matter if you write mellow, ambient music or over-the-top pop. Do what you do immediately and emphatically. Having this recording allows you not only to use it to get the gig, but also provides the backbone for what you should use to promote the gig. You need a press package. In this press package, you should, should be your three or four song CD. It's fine to just have it in a clear slipcase with your contact information on both the disc itself and whatever package you choose. A bio, a photo, a personal letter. The bio should be succinct. If you can, have someone else write it. It's very hard to write about yourself. Include some lyric samples or quotes from the band members, as well as some laudatory quotes from any notables who may have said something nice about the band. Avoid using phrases such as, we sound like a mix of the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Uh, no, you don't. Instead, say who you are influenced by, or better, who you have performed with. Keep it short, one page if possible. The photo, like the recording, should give the person looking at it a very clear sense of who the artist is. Again, avoid gimmicks unless you're some sort of novelty band. The personal note should be very brief and simply state why you're sending this package to the recipient. Remember, it's about value alignment. You need to show the recipient not only that you understand what they value, but that your music aligns with it. As, your prog as you progress, you can and should include a tour itinerary, as well as some neatly pasted up press clippings. Of course, it goes without saying that all of the above, minus the personal letter, should be available on your website. Notice how I didn't say MySpace page? If you don't have a website, now is the time to get one. If this is an insurmountable challenge, you may want to reconsider your commitment to this whole music business thing. With this press package in hand, you can start to build a community. Keeping in mind the fact that we are shrinking our world, it makes no sense for you to be sending your press package off to Rolling Stone. It does make sense to send it to the regional publications and blogs whose values align with yours. However, even then, it really only makes sense to do this to let them know you have an upcoming show. The goal is to utilize this press package to begin creating dialogue. You want a dialogue with your fans, with the media, and potentially with labels. 
The show is where the conversation must begin. The conversation, of course, doesn't end with just your fans. It extends out to all the spokes that surround the hub of the live show. The agents, the managers, lawyers, retailers, and all the others who make up this ecosystem. By considering your outreach as a dialogue, it directs your attention in the appropriate manner. As you would in an actual conversation, here too, you want to know the person with whom you're speaking, you want to engage their interest, and when you're done speaking with them, you want them to go and tell others how great you are.